Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to another episode of the Political Tipster. Um, we are just days away from the very, very crucial US presidential election. And uh, if you were to look at the polls at the moment, it, it seems like an incredibly tight race. So uh, with me to break it down, a uh, very special guest. Uh, welcome, Pangolins. <laughs> Good to be here. Um... I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And for any of the previous listeners, I hope to have a better track record for any guests I make than we did on the midterm <laughs> midterm uh, predictions, which I I have to hold my hands up and say, man, I got so little right there. Um, so, you know, may, maybe a little bit more guarded on my uh, more sweeping predictions this time. Save my save my uh, glorious reputation. <laughs> well, you, you can be forgiven for for your predictions because every pollster pretty much had the Republicans sweeping up both the house and the Senate. Uh, what went so wrong? You know, in my opinion, like there's a couple of things that went wrong, like, especially if you were looking like, if you're a GOP strategist and you were trying to like reverse engineer what actually caused the red wave that wasn't, I mean, I guess it's clear that especially the, end of row was actually more of a galvanizing vote um uh, like a, a vote maker or a galvanizing issue for the democrat base in the run-up to that than a lot of people were accounting for and the other thing and it's interesting that this might be more muted in its effect this go round, is the effect of early voting because so many of the votes for those midterms had already kind of taken place before the campaigns like had really like settled into their final days so a lot of when I mean, you were looking at the polling as it was tightening and the momentum changing, et cetera, et cetera. By that time, a lot of it was already decided. Um, so, you know, yeah. if, you, if you have a situation where 50 percent of the votes are coming in, well, then functionally, the campaign doesn't matter. Right. Um, like because you've already lost half of the potential votes that could um, could influence it. Um, but what's interesting is, is I think that unlike the midterms, when we're going into the presidential election with at least one known quantity who has a very energized base, um, I'm not sure it's going to have as much of an effect this go round. So not only of, uh, uh, not only because, from what I can see, there does seem to be a reduction in people who are going for early voting, per se. Um, the GOP have made it a serious part of their campaign to make sure that yeah. they utilize that tool as well. Um, whereas before they were like, no, we're going to, we're going to save it for voting day. And like, if you see the big Trump boosters at the moment, I'm thinking people like Jack Posobiec, they are telling everyone vote early, you know, vote as early as you can. And like, you know, double, triple check, like vote early now. And if you want to make sure that you like, if you want to go on election day, you can, and then you can just, you know, like confirm it then, et cetera, et cetera. So a, a change, there's definitely been a change in strategy from the GOP going into this one. I think um, maybe in the midterms, they were thinking that they could run elections in the, uh, you know, the old mold, but now they've just seemingly like uh, they've just decided now we, we have to play by the rules as they are like we have to play the game as we find it rather than how we wish we find it, which, you know, may mute that effect somewhat as we go into into this um, plus as well as that. It's I think it's undeniable that even if the even if the GOP were looking like and ultimately the GOP did barely take the house, um, there, mm. there, there, there's a lot in the issues with the house and we could probably touch on that later um because it seems like increasingly there's almost no real toss-ups um in congressional districts like there's the, it's 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 a it's a very small pool now so it seems like the house is always going to be close going forward and the senate like i mean like I said the early voting and then there were people who actually did just outperform expectations you know like in terms of their electoral strength you know i'm thinking in particular of one John Fetterman, um, who, <laughs> who quite literally, I think, had a stroke in that campaign, and, and um, so I mean, who could have predicted that he was uh, going to be as popular as he was? Um, is that effect muted by Trump being on the top of the ticket? Well, I, I guess we'll have to see. 
Um, because it certainly seems like his base is energized. And if he's doing well in a lot of these states, we'll have to see how that affects the down ticket. It might not. Um, but who knows? Yeah, I'm thinking about the race. Uh, is it in North Carolina? Uh, Trump is up, but uh, his, the, the Republican Senate candidate, Mark Robinson, he's, he's down double digit figures so it, it, there seems to be a lot of uh split ticketing uh going on in according to the polls mm. and what's more if you look at like the other senate races but we could probably take that later um like if we look at the main battlegrounds that are because it's kind of like a fate accompli at this point that the gop are going to pick up the senate i think barring some absolute disaster for them just because of the map as it lies and because of Joe Manchin's retirement, like you're looking at a blood red um, Senate um, constituency that no longer has like a popular incumbent there. So it seems mm. it, it seems very likely that West Virginia is going to go their way. And I believe it's also Montana. Yeah. Like, I mean, yeah. it, it just seems very unlikely that they would lose even either of those seats. So, you know, it, like anything could happen, I suppose. But seems plausible at this point as we go into this that the senate looks to be a lot for the gop how strong a senate um uh, advantage they have who knows um they could lose every other race but you know it, again it, it, i think it really will depend on how much the split ticketing is actually happening um and it, it's really difficult to determine from the polls at the moment like it seems like the races are narrowing but other times the polls like i don't know if you've noticed this but they just seem all over the place like it, it, yeah it, i i can't i can't keep up anymore I, I, i've almost given up on it because uh one day it's kamala plus five points another it's trump plus two it, it's just there's such a wide range and it, it's it's almost ridiculous to have these polling average services because you seem to have a such a wide array and it's impossible to keep up at the moment yeah and like i mean aside from some countries that do polling like quite famously quite well like australia etc like i mean you know just looking at like polling methodology like ringing people on the phone i mean i've never been polled um i've lived in two countries you know ireland and the uk that at least do engage in political polling but i've never been polled uh, i i don't even know anyone who's been asked on these and then if you get to like online surveys like how reliable is an online survey that is open to potentially being brigaded you know we've all seen polls on x formerly twitter where you know a, an interested group of people with a large platform will go out of their way to sway a poll just for the sake of it you know that that, that that's that's almost impossible to stop um with an online system and then again in terms of like who has a landline i mean i don't um so i i wonder if there's just a pile of stuff in here that the polling can't detect like i would be very very curious to know um this is another weird thing about the United States. They both parties have their maintained internal polling, which we don't see. So like, yeah. what what methodology are they using? Um, I, I I would be very curious to know, but I imagine that's a closely guarded secret in both uh, both cases. You know, they're they're not going to let me know. Um, that's 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 for that's for uh, that's for more important people to know, and me not to. You know. And then going back to the midterms it seemed like the political landscape was was changing because before the midterms it was almost seen that uh president biden was a, was a one term president he was a transition president and it looked like kamala harris was was going to be the next candidate um and and then on the the republican side it, it looked like trump was regaining control of the party but once those results came in, that sort of took a knockback on Kamala's campaign. It, it, it almost entrusted Joe Biden with uh, being the candidate for, for the next election. And and on the Republican side, it, a lot of these Trump-backed candidates did, did surprisingly bad. And mm. 
I, I remember the, the there was that famous headline Ron the Future. Was, <laughs> yes. uh, I believe only Florida and, and New York and Orange County and uh, swung in the Republicans' favor. So Ron DeSantis was was being touted as the the, the, next. the candidate. So what, what what's happened in those two years since the midterms, which has swung the momentum back towards the Trump Kamala head to head? I think ultimately, like let's take the easy one first. Um, it, let, let's start with how, why Trump has recaptured the party. I mean, like Ron DeSantis, as far as it seems that he's incredibly popular in the state of Florida. Um, I'm not a Floridian, so I couldn't speak to any personal experience. But, you know, the, the state has gone from very, very close to what seems like um, blood red over the course of the last mm. four years. Um, and at least that is a lot of that might be due to... Um, just various exoduses that happen from the more uh the the more red parts of like new york state and various other surrounding states um whereas you could see maybe the opposite in arizona which once was a very very republican state but due to the influx of people from california has become much more purple um but i think what ultimately happened and people always forget this is that it's really really tough to um on foot or like to, to 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 what's the word throw trump off of his game when it comes to an actual like like blood you know like what's the word like when it comes to an actual grapple especially with other members of the gop um he's got a very good he's got a very good way of coining nicknames that kind of define the candidates or the other candidates for everyone and as well as that, I mean, it, it just seemed that a lot of the other guys who may be doing particularly well in the likes of Florida, you know, like DeSantis, he just didn't have the charisma to make to take it up to the next stage. Because ultimately, if you want to win the ticket, you've got to convince at least a plurality of the other states that might be interested in your that, that might be interested in your um candidacy and ultimately trump has 100 percent name recognition not just in his party but in like the world i, I would say mm -hmm. that you would have to like travel to some very out some very remote places to find someone who has not heard of him so getting over that particular like even if you don't like him you know who he is and name recognition is huge in politics and ultimately desantis may have had it for florida but he didn't have it for um the, the the wider electorate of the Republican Party, as well as that, I, I think we can now say with some confidence that, or with you know, with like with some, I guess, with some hindsight, the campaign that he ran wasn't good. Like it just wasn't good. It was it, it, to me, it seemed like it was very online. It was um, like very almost like cringe meme um, type of campaign. Yeah, um, yeah. and. and you know, maybe, maybe there would be a time and place where that would work. It just didn't seem to, it, it didn't click for him. You, um, you seem to try to outflank Trump uh, on the right with uh, certain social issues. So, for example, the, the trans issue. Mm. He, he, I remember he his official campaign put out a video of Trump being very LGBTQ friendly. But I, I as much as it might rile up some parents, I, d I don't think the trans issue is, is big enough to, to sway an election. And I, I thought he, he put too much emphasis on these more niche social issues that have... Uh, yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. Um, but as well as that, the big thing that I think um, uh, DeSantis was banking on was that there would kind of be a residual groundswell of support for him being, you know, the the governor that was like most opposed or you know by reputation or like at least the reputation that I gleaned from it. I don't know the actual um, policies that were implemented in all of these states, but he was, you know, the no lockdown governor. And it seemed like by the time mm -hmm. we got to the midterms, people were just like so willing to push COVID out of their memory that it almost didn't materialize. <laughs> Um, in anyone's mind um, as we got through the campaign. Um, and then it's, it, I, I think that that is ultimately what harmed him, you know, because 
maybe if this had taken place at, at a different period, the fact that he was, you know, the, the the guy who kept Florida open would have made more of a difference. And, you know, when you could point to, um, you know, Donald and I would say his, uh, for lack of a better word, I guess, vacillating um, policy approaches as it came to the, the pandemic. But ultimately, it's it's kind of like, it, 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 it seems like he, he had... The, it was like wrong timing um, because may, maybe he could have done another few years as Florida governor. And then when there's no actual can't like when Trump can't run again or well, I mean, assuming he wins this time, um, it's it, but it, it, it would seem unlikely that he would get nominated again if he lost twice in a row. But, you know, I suppose it's 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 conceivable that, that could have happened. But um, he's also uh, he's also fairly old. So, you know, m maybe. Uh, wrong, wrong timing for uh, for 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 uh, for DeSantis out of Florida. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, go on. Yeah, and and, and onto the the Democrat side of things. Um, what what I found quite amazing is how we've brushed under the carpet the fact that there was a huge media cover up of uh, Joe Biden's mental decline. I mean. I knew it, you knew it, mm. the average, every person in the, the US knew that he was mentally declined, but for some reason or another, well, I think we know the reasons, uh, we, we were being told he was, he was fine and. Oh, he's, it, he's it, the it, smartest he's ever been. Really. It, it, it seems to have just been swept under the rug. Uh, I, I think ultimately that. <laughs> The fact that he has fallen on his sword, like let 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 let's let's take Biden and Kamala for for a spell here. I think that there is no one in the upper ranks of the Democratic Party that actually wanted Kamala Harris to be at the top of this ticket. Like I, I I'm convinced mm -hmm. that, that she. The problem was is that the timing of the various things that made it pretty much impossible for anyone to deny um, Joe Biden's mental decline. Um, the timing of that was such that I think that certain states you wouldn't have been able to re-register a new candidate in time i mean maybe you could have pushed for this but it would have been very difficult and as well as that the funding that biden had raised would have been i think dispersed back so that would have made it a very very difficult thing you'd have been going in with potentially a candidate that has very little re name recognition um after having just yeeted joe biden out of um his uh, position as incumbent and you would have been doing that against a very stiff uh, funding backdrop but no one can tell me that if this had like if Kamala had gone on a primary that I, I don't think she'd have won um, and what's more I don't think that for I think for lack of any other option that is why she's at the top of this ticket right now um, I think people have, have also forgotten that in the, the last primary in which she ran she got one or two percent in her own home state. Mm -hmm. she, I mean, Project Kamala Harris died during that primary because she did so horrifically bad, and it, it's only because of the circumstances in which we've spoken about that she's managed to make a comeback. But she was a disaster in the in the primary in which she ran. She, Bernie Sanders was going to smoke her out of her own state, and that I think she—I think she dropped out before that point. To, to if I if I if I recall the the, the flow of events correctly, Tulsi Gabbard had a famous kind of repost with her, mm -hmm. which completely sad sandbagged her for the the progressive base of the Democrat Party, and um, Bernie <laughs> Sanders was the guy with the wind in his sails. Um, and then in 2020, I think there was probably some kind of deal made between herself and Joe Biden to get her on the bottom of the ticket, which, you know, was probably why, even though it was looking quite dicey for Joe um, until Super Tuesday, um, mm. I believe it was Super Tuesday, uh, when he outperformed in a lot of the um, the southern states um, with a particularly uh, strong showing among African-Americans. Um, so I, I think that that's ultimately what, I mean, you kind of have to admire Harris. It seems like she is the master at failing upwards. Um, I don't know <laughs> that anyone has ever done it better than that. Um, <laughs> it, she's now potentially going to fail upwards into one of the 
into the most important <laughs> position in in the Western political world. Um, some it's somewhat incredible to think about. It, yeah. it, it's, it's almost like a comedy of errors here. But would if would the serious strategists in the Democrat Party have picked her? In isolation? Nah, I don't. I, I don't think so. Now, in fairness, I also think the same is broadly true of Trump and the GOP. I think there's a not insubstantial contingent of the GOP <laughs> that very much wishes that Trump would go away, but uh, he just keeps coming back. Yeah, they'll, they'll be ruining uh, not being the Conservative Party of uh, of Britain, where they, they have their own Rishi Sunak uh, waiting in the wings uh, to, to replace the uh, democratically elected uh, candidate. Well, you know, I mean, looking at that, look at how well that went for them. Um, Rishi Sunak having completely collapsed. I mean, the you know, it, it's off topic, but the collapse of the fortunes of the Tory party is almost like what what it, it's Icarian. Uh, it, it's impossible to overstate how badly they, they, mm. they mess it up. And I think that's if the GOP wanted to go back to the um, the Jebs of the world, I think the same would happen to them. But um, yeah. for, for various reasons, I think the United States is a little bit better at allowing insurgent forces in their politics. Um, but that, that that's completely off topic. So, <laughs> well, Bouncing off of that, so we've talked in the last podcast about how the the Republican Party has has changed dramatically since Trump uh, became the leader. What about the Democrat Party? How how has it governed under Joe Biden? Did did we see a shift away from Obama's uh, tenureship? Have we? seen major shift from Trump's economic policy? How would you sum up the, the last four years? Of... With, without being too um, inflammatory, I would say that it's like Trumpian politics with progressive uh, characteristics. Um, I mean, a lot of the tariff stuff Joe Biden pretty much kept in um, the industrial or, you know, like the, 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 the infrastructure and industrial policy stuff he kind of kept, albeit with um, in the case of um, the Inflation Reduction Act. It does seem like a lot of that went into like green energy solutions, which is very much I, I, I would doubt that if Trump had passed that bill, that that would have been where the funding went. But, you know, putting that aside from now. Um, in terms of their foreign policy, uh, you know, the, the, the Democrat foreign policy under Joe Biden um, is, I, I think it is very much in 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 the the keeping of the Obama foreign policy, you know, that there did seem to be an attempt to want to reset relations with Iran again, which is was the kind of overarching political goal of the Obama White House, um, you know, which resulted in that uh, that Iran nuclear deal, um, which was then nixed. Um, then, you know, that there, there was some of the more populisty stuff that you could say that Trump was going to do, although Trump would say that he was not going to do it in that way. You know, the departure from Afghanistan, um, the funding of the uh, Ukrainian armed forces, although you know, I guess it's it, 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 it's it's a great open question that we'll never have an answer hey. to as to whether or not the Ukraine war would have happened without um, Joe Biden being in post. Uh, I wouldn't want to speculate on that. It's just uh, it's food for thought, you know. Um, but the economics, I would say, are quite similar, albeit with some redistributionist stuff, which kind of befits a more progressive party. Um, and then... I, I, I would say overall, it's kind of like half and half taking what they thought they could take from Trump and kind of putting a uh, an Obama-esque sheen on it. Because I, I think that the, the, the open secret is that Obama is in much more, um, he has much more influence even among Biden and Harris than that that is supposed. Oh. Like he's, a, he's an incredibly influential figure in the party. So how much of what, has gone on would he disagree with i mean i'd say he'd probably be disagree he disagree with things that are notably unpopular um but how much he would have done different i would say very little but overall i, I would say that 
maybe maybe you disagree, but there's been more continuity with a lot of cer certainly Trumpian economic policy than there has been um, change. Um, and foreign policy is just like a completely separate beast. Uh, for my money, I think the Biden presidency has been a complete disaster on the foreign pro policy front. But you know, yeah, yeah. wouldn't want to wouldn't want to editorialize too much here. But uh, yeah, well, well, his his biggest probably the the two biggest bills that he passed during his tenure was the the, um, the Inflation Reduction Act and the Chip and what was it Chip and. Oh, the Chips Act. Yeah, that would have been yeah, a big yeah. push for uh, for tech, but and and like they're 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 astonishingly costly bills, by the way. Like they have been huge. They've run up the tally hugely. But um, like in th would would Trump have not have not um passed a bill to protect semiconductors in the United States? I I, I have my doubts. He, pr he probably would have done it in a different implementation. But I I feel like that would have been a that would have been something he could have gotten behind. Um. Then the Inflation Reduction Act. I mean, that's just a that's just an unbelievable um, amount of uh, currency to throw at um, <laughs> reducing inflation. I'm I'm not I, I'm not an economist, so I wouldn't want to venture as to how effective that has been. But you know, I I I, I know for my money, I wouldn't want to massively print money to reduce inflation, just like on an instinctive basis. But yeah, <laughs> it's neither here nor there. So. Quite often, I think every time uh, there's an election, Americans uh, are also asked in a survey, do you feel better off than you were four years ago? Uh, interestingly, Trump in the previous election was the first president to lose an election uh, in which the majority of people said they were better off than they were four years ago. Mm. The, this election, is it the classic, uh, was it Clinton who said, it's, is the economy stupid? Do, do you think this, this election has, has been fought off the economy? I mean, it, it's funny because I would certainly say that there has been, like when, when it was the Biden campaign, I think there was a lot of an attempt to kind of spin the economic news as if it had been broadly good it does seem like a lot of these figures are now being revising revised down certainly the uh, job figures etc cetera, etc cetera. so i feel like that was their play i am not so sure that that has been an efficacious strategy and i don't what's curious if you contrast it with the harris campaign is how policy light um harris's campaign yeah. pitch has been so far it's it, it's almost weirdly um what's the word it, it it it's a bit schizophrenic in a way because it will be like we're the change candidate but also i love everything joe biden did and would absolutely do it all again but you know i, I feel like that's something that she's got to try and do because i for my money i think that the 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 the, the, the feeling on the ground certainly when it comes to like the cost of um cost of everyday items and rise in fuel prices, et cetera, has probably been that people, whatever whatever spin and cope mechanism is coming out from the legacy press, people don't feel better off. Um, so if they were if they were going to fight on the uh, the, the economic ground, I, I think that they would get tightly thrashed. Um, but that's that's just my own inclination there. Biden, you could at least make the case that he was like, well, we the, the inflation top line figures have come down. Um, but do people feel better off? And if this was a, an, an election on economics, is this going to do particularly well for the incumbent presidential duo? I, I wouldn't think so, yeah. um, which is honestly why I think that they've pivoted to, on the one hand, more social issues, and then you get the reheating of the various um, claims of Trump and his latent Hitlerism. You know, I, I think that's why they're pushing the campaign the way they are doing it. Um, so if it's the economy stupid um it's clear that the democrats certainly don't want it to be the economy whereas you can see from trump as you know my beautiful economy i, I have a terrible trump impression i'd love to <laughs> have a good one but uh we had the greatest economy etc etc yeah. et you know so i mean he clearly wants it to be in that space um but the democrats i think for good reason don't um so we'll have to see which has more cut through on the day 
Um, it does well, appear. Apart, it, apart from uh, economics, what what other po policy uh, spaces have, have been most important to the electorate? I mean, I think, I think, I think there's no doubt that um, uh, immigration has been mm. certainly mm. one that the GOP base has been focusing on quite heavily. I mean, we've had instances over the last couple of years where even um, state governors like uh, the Texas governor Abbott and the Florida, you know, Ron DeSantis have been making great political hay by sending um, illegal arrivals up to New York or to Martha's Vineyard, as was oh, yeah. done. Um, they, uh, there was the famous headline they they enriched us for the the two hours they were there before it, it, it was it, sent it, back. it was uh, it was it was quite funny um hats off there that was that was a that was a pretty <laughs> pretty good political stunt if you're trying to trying to em embarrass the uh, social progressives of the most costly um uh, real estate and much of the uh, the, the north american continent um but Immigration does seem to be one that is coming up more and more. The economy does seem to be coming up more and more. Um, like even when you, and we could maybe touch on this more later, but in the interview that Kamala did with Brett Baer from Fox News, I mean, that seemed to be where he was pushing her hardest on. You know, they, they, the Trump campaign has made a great deal about the fact that she was a appointed border star, although she, 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 she disagrees with uh, that um title having been attached to her uh, i mean i can i can i can see evidence of that having been done but you know i'm sure that there's some kind of hair that they're splitting there to say that no 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 she was never actually the border czar she was the border czarina or something like that i, I have no idea um but it, yeah immigration the economy and i think for the democrat side they're still making a big push on um abortion um reproductive rights in general yeah. Yeah. Um, and as well as that, I think the, uh, the, 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 the health of the democracy has been another one that they've been making uh, a yeah. great hay out, out of. Um, but I, I, I would say that it, between those four, you've probably got the top for both parties. Um, I, I, if, if the U S experience is anything like the British experience, um, immigration's probably going to be, if not the number one, it will be very near the number one and capable of quickly going to the number one as things, um, as events occur. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that, that, that's the weird thing about, like, even if you look at these, uh, at the polling issues, there's, you know, they talk about issue salience, um, you know, for a lot of people, immigration one way or the other might be their top line issue that like is always there. But even people who might be interested in the economy or the abor or like uh, abortion access or um, the health of the democracy might also still think immigration is very important. So it's it's it, it, it's 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 in, it'll be interesting to see what that kind of crossover is there. You know, I think Trump uh, has played his cards quite well. Uh integrating those two together i remember he quite often in the debate he was talking about uh, illegal immigrants coming to uh, take hispanic and black jobs was his exact quote uh, and that there was an interesting poll uh, which was on uh, nbc possibly which showed that actually over 70 percent of uh, latinos in the u.s uh, said that trump was not referring to them when he was talking about immigrants so it, it seems that Trump's messaging on immigration has, has played actually quite well with uh, ethnic minorities in the US. Well, I mean, it's especially um, like it, it, it does seem to be having some cut through. I know that this has been a bit of a mirage for the GOP before. Um, I think, to my knowledge, the only GOP president who has ever won either think 50 percent plus of the latino vote like i mean excluding some very very hardline republican uh latinos in like the cubano community um george bush uh jr i think was the last one to have picked up 50 percent or close to it of the latino vote but what's well, going to be interesting to see um and it's one thing that we have seen i think in the uk as well as in the us is that there's now an emerging gap between men and women as it relates to yeah. um, political positions. So what, to what extent 
Trump attracts the um, the black male vote or the Latino male vote and loses to um, loses, you know, like white women, Latino women, et cetera, et cetera. That's going to be very interesting to see because that is that's a great conundrum going forward politically if the if the if the genders themselves are diverging on politics. Um, but we shall we shall see, I suppose. And then looking at the campaigns, how how would you say both campaigns have been run? Um, have they been effective? Uh, what, well, what have they been trying to push? Let's, um, if we want to take the campaigns, right, I think that it's hard to assess Trump's campaign objectively because I think that particularly the shot of um, the assassination and, uh, you know, the survived assassination attempt it's almost like it, 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 it's 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 very visually impactful. It's very memorable, like you know, and, and that's me vastly understating it. Um, how much of the campaign, other than that, could anyone will anyone remember five years hence? It's it's really hard to say. There have been some stuff that I've really enjoyed, like uh, Hulk Hogan at the RNC, um, <laughs> ripping his shirt, rending his garments in twain. As he says, let Trumpomania rule again. You know, I mean that 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 was that was certainly entertaining, if nothing else. Um, the McDonald's, uh... Uh, the McDonald's, but that was that to me was a clever bit of campaigning. Mm. I, I I I thought that was really effective, especially that that was in I think it was in Pennsylvania. So you know, like him being in a working class role, getting out in the streets, you know, like engaging in I guess classic Americana for lack of a better yeah. word, you know, like what, what's more American than McDonald's, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, um, I thought that was a very effective piece of, um, campaigning. Um, overall, I think that both him and Vance have played a very interesting game because rather than what they, you know, the, 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 the They've taken a very unorthodox stance as it relates to abortion, for example. You know, that they, they, they've basically just said we are going to leave it to the states and then will not discuss the action or the item very yeah. further, which is an interesting bit of um, uh, political con or political judo. And as much as it kind of defangs it, because they can then just say, look, it's up to your the democracy in your state as to how you want to approach this issue, um, which I think has been effective. Um, it it does appear that Trump took a little bit of a hit with um, with with the Vance pick. I'm not sure how much I like would say that with like hand on heart that it was it it, it, it was it's it's interesting that he would take a figure like Vance, who is a senator in Ohio, which is a very very red state, rather than maybe one of these other um, states that are more in play. Um, which to me kind of indicates that they were confident going into it, that they could just like double down on having someone who is effectively like Trump, new, new model Trump for, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. um, which, which does like, I mean, if you're looking at how the various camps are acting versus what everyone's saying, it does appear that the Trump campaign is going into this with some confidence. I, I've I've read as well that uh, the Vance pick was was a very interesting one because it's it's almost a, a new electorate that um, Trump is trying to tap into. They've they've now labelled it the Joe Rogan right. <laughs> yes, these young men who are frustrated with the if I'm used to, if I can say the woke nonsense and the, there's a a thirst for a, a return to masculinity and the, mm. the old notions of masculinity and Trump doing well, going on to the Joe Rogan podcast itself. And like, he seems to be going on to a lot of these podcasts, which young men who are normally a bit detached from politics, not interested will, will be listening to. And he's almost tapped into a new electorate there. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that, because if you look at it from that vantage point, then the Vance pick does actually make sense. You know, this is a man of Appalachia, after all, you know, which is, you know, <laughs> very, very poor, 
um, blue collar working class. Like, I mean, the signal could be that, you know, wherever you are, it's not just Appalachia. If you're a blue collar guy who works with his hands, you know, I've got your back, you know, you are my, uh, you are my political constituency. And from that point of view, you know, Vance, Vance is very much from that oeuvre. I mean, He's very successful now, but, you know, from what I understand, the circumstances were very, very poor growing up. You know, he's, he's not, he's, he's, he's had his family struggles with addiction, which, you know, is another thing that is increasingly uh, afflicting um, these, these uh, Rust Belt or um, Appalachian communities, you know, family breakdown, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, that it is interesting that, 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 that does appear to be what they are attempting to do. You know, the, the disaffected, um, the disaffected working class male um, as, as, as a main policy or like as a main campaign plank. Um, yeah, that, 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 that does seem to check out. Now, if we want to take the, uh, the other campaign, um, I, I think that like, it, it, it's hard to say what Biden's overall campaigning strategy was. I mean, I can't even remember it beyond the uh, the debate itself. Like, his collapse was so total that I think that it was just impossible for anyone to remember anything else. Um, I'm sure he would have said, like, and I, I seem to recall, it's like, you know, we've done well on reducing inflation. We're going to stick up with our, or stick up to um, enemies foreign and domestic um with our allies um etc cetera, etc cetera. That, that that seemed to be the push they were making harris um i don't know how much of this you've seen but it does seem like the there is a certain uh element of woman scolding going on in the uh mm. in the harris campaign um you know i know matthew iglesias who's you know a, a progressive um uh, progressive journalists they they were running this ad campaign where women were you know blowing up their balloon whenever the guy says that they don't vote um michelle obama has recently made a statement at a harris rally you know actually i've got that quote so i mean uh i'll just give this so that people can have a flavor of it to the women listening we have every right to demand the men in our lives do better by us we have to use our voices to make these choices clear to the men that we love our lives are worth more than their anger and disappointment so that is um uh, i don't know how effective you find that i personally think that if you're trying to appeal to the male vote with uh sentiments like that i think it is uh it's it, it it's a brave gamble to hector them for yeah. their vote. Um, so we we shall have to see how efficacious that was in shoring up um, Kamala Harris's popularity uh, among <laughs> among uh, Gen X uh, or sorry Gen X and below men. Um, <laughs> I have my doubts. What what about the Tim Waltz pick? I, I found that really bemusing myself because. I, I was almost sure she was going to pick Shapiro. Um, it, it was, you know, Pennsylvania. It's probably the most important state of the election. And she picked someone from Minnesota instead, who's probably more to the left of, of her. I mean, there's a certain amount of that. I, I, I would have to, I would say that there's a couple of things going on there. Um, I have a feeling that Shapiro um, and the other, um, the other famous, um, fresh face of the Democrat party, um, Gavin Newsom. Mm. I would, I, I would almost, I would be fairly confident that Newsom turned her down. Um, simply because he did, I, 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 I don't think he wanted to be, he didn't want to touch this. Um, as for Shapiro, I think, um, there is a certain element at the moment, um, that, and this is going to be very interesting to see how this actually affects the election itself. Um, the the situation in Israel and Gaza has been a disaster for the Democratic Party. I think um, there, the, I think there's a very strong element um, of uh, fear that that is going to demoralize their base so much um, that I almost think that they have been, and, and it's difficult for them, right? Because there's 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 a lot of donations that go into. Um, uh, into that, like, you know, from APAC, et cetera, that ma make it difficult for them to take anything other than a, a strong pro-Israel stance. But it's also true that the makeup of their electorate, which includes a lot of college-educated um, young people, 
um, really, really aren't with the party as it relates to this issue. So I think they've, they've been trying to play both sides and I'm not sure how effective that <laughs> has been, um, to put it mildly, but I, I'm feeling that there is at least some cognizance of Shapiro's um his positions and you know his 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 stances on the issue that probably went into that um how much of this i wouldn't want to speculate like it, it does make sense to me that you would pick a, a what seems to be a, a reasonably popular government for pennsylvania if that's a must-win state for you but also if you're going to be hemorrhaging your core base if you do so it, it's kind of like uh you know you 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 you, you got to you got to you got to pick which uh, which which unenviable option you're going to undertake there. And I guess for their purposes, they thought it was more efficacious to pick someone who, like you said, might be more popular among the, uh, the progressive base than Shapiro was. Uh, let's look at the states themselves. So it, it looks like we're going to have seven swing states this year, but some polls are suggesting that the likes of Virginia, Minnesota may be in play as well, New Hampshire. But for now, let's look at the seven swing states. So Nevada, that was touted to be probably Kamala Harris's most favoured state, but early voting seems to have the Republicans ahead and, and the bookies now has Republicans one to two to, to win. So what what's going on in Nevada? Well, I mean, Nevada has kind of been trending red the last few cycles. I mean, for the longest time, the GOP did make any attempt in Nevada, um, from what I understand, because of its proximity to California and the yeah. uh, the uh, the California Democratic machine just made it difficult to get anything off the ground. Like the Democrats have a fearsome ground game in those surrounding states, you know, that that are near California, just because of the amount of cash and bodies they can throw at it. Um but, you know, it has been coming closer and closer. Um, will it ultimately flip red this time? We shall we shall see. Um, it's looking good for them, but it was also looking good for them vis-a-vis, um, -vis, uh, I believe, some of the midterm races, and it, it didn't pan out. Now, New Hampshire, yeah. New Hampshire is a very strange situation um, because it, New Hampshire, like, is the state that will do the most split ticketing. Like they will have elected, like I think Governor Sununu to the tune of like ten or fifteen percentage points. That guy won, but then you would have had down ballot Democrats that blew out the uh, the Republican candidate, and then the the state itself will go blue. So it's it's always a weird one. It's very very difficult to predict with New Hampshire in particular, I think. Um, but yeah, Nevada. I mean, it, it it's trending trending to the GOP, but you know, that, that has been thought to be happening a couple of times before, and they just haven't been able to seal the deal. Um, we'll, we, we shall have to see if this time is different, you know, I would say if I was putting money on it right now, well, I'm, the, the political tipster podcast, I would have my doubts vis-a-vis -vis Nevada, but like just, just simply because of that Democrat machine, but it, it, it if if the polls are as they say they are, and even if you know some of these polls might be understating the so-called Trump effect, well then if they are understating the Trump effect, he's going to say Nevada, no 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 doubt. But um, again, very hard to determine. Like I mean, if we're looking at the average for Nevada right now, I mean, let's let's just have a very quick look on it because if it's a, if it's like I th I believe it's pulling ahead into like one to two territory, which would which would be advantage Trump. Okay, so it's still like, it's 0. 0.7. So I mean, effectively, that is a statistical tie. But I think we the, the big open question for a lot of these states is just how understated or overstated the Trump support actually is. Mm -hmm. um, if it, if it's anything like 2016, then he, he's he's going he's going to he's going to carry that state. But you know, maybe the maybe the pollsters have learned their lesson. <laughs> Uh, I think according to the polls and according to uh, the bookies, the, the Sun Belt is, is where Trump is is effectively going to flip both Arizona and um, and Georgia and hold mm. on to North Carolina. Have you, have you seen anything that could suggest otherwise there? Other than it being close in terms of the aggregate polling, I mean, 
you know, North Carolina and Georgia are states that like, well, I mean, he, he's, he's, he's done reasonably well in North Carolina up to now. Georgia, I mean, he famously lost that in 2020. Um, I haven't seen anything that would incline me to believe that North Carolina isn't going his way, um, particularly if he carries the other southern states, you know, like if Georgia goes red and so South Carolina and North Carolina, like, you'd have to imagine that th those will kind of come like if if he if he's polling strongly in one, he should be polling or he should do well in the others. Um, the same is also true if we want to take those east or those uh, west coast states of Nevada and Arizona. You you'd kind of feel that if he's outperforming in one of them, he probably will be outperforming in mm. both of them. Um, and that's also true of like the wider Rust Belt. Like it, it just doesn't seem possible that he would be doing particularly well in like. Ohio, Michigan, without doing well in like Wisconsin or Pennsylvania, just it, it it seems plausible to me that this is like kind of coming as a package, you know. And those would be the three main sectors that he's got to like, he's got to shore up his support in, or he's got he's got to carry to win, you know. What about the uh, the black vote in in Georgia? Because uh, that's effectively uh, it was the. The black vote in Atlanta, which which flipped the the state in favor of of Joe Biden, how, but we, how, we should... how do you think that could affect the the election this time? Now? It's really interesting to see because it does appear that there is at least a detectable change in um, stance among black men in particular, and if that if that effect is real, and it doesn't even have to be that they turn out to vote for him. If they just stayed home when they would have gone out for Joe Biden, well, then that will have a measurable interest or impact. Like assuming that the Democrats or like Kamala don't carry that 10 to 15 percent of black men that either stay home or go over to Trump. I mean, that will be that that will decide those states like that. That would have been the that would have been the edge, you know, Um like especially if you and, and like that if that if that effect is not just a mirage which let's be very clear has been the case before um then trump then trump will carry these states um but you know any anything could happen uh, famously predictions are difficult especially about the future um it does appear that there is actually genuinely some major um cultural figures that um you know, like 50 Cent and um, various others seem to be inclining their way towards Trump. I mean, maybe that has a, a big impact. Uh, it, it, it's really hard to tell. Um, but it does seem like there is something going on. Um, and if it is going on to the tune of 10 or 15 percent of black males, it's hard to see how the Democrats are going to pick up yeah. the corresponding white working class male vote in order to blunt that effect. Um, but, you know, maybe it is all just a mirage. Um, famously, uh, we did have the implosion one. Um, uh, maybe, maybe I shouldn't even bring up the uh, <laughs> the the, uh, the 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 former candidate for uh, oh, for office that uh, had a somewhat disastrous um, <laughs> campaign um, involving Alex Jones and Annette. Um, so I'll <laughs> just leave it at that, I suppose. So let, let's say Trump managed to to help. Ah, to hold on to the, the Sun Belt. That, that means he only has to win one of uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, or Pennsylvania to win the election. Mm. How, how do you think he's going to do in, in those three states? Well, these are states that he has won in the past. Um, and like, I think especially like Pennsylvania, or it's a Michigan, like, you know, he's, he's a big guy for the industry, so, uh, the industry stuff. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's not inconceivable that they would, they would, they would, they would swing back behind him. Um, Pennsylvania, as I understand it, is fracking country. And if, the, if you're voting on the basis of uh, fracking country, I would say that you have to give the advantage to Trump there. He has been famously, you know, drill, baby, drill. Um, and if you're, if you're in the petrochemical industry, which as I understand a lot of Pennsylvanians are, or at least even the economics surrounding the petro industry will be massively impactful um, in Pennsylvania. Well, then he probably does have an advantage on that because um, I mean this is a state as 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 previously noted that he has picked up in the past. And is Kamala going to be more popular than Joe Biden in 
these uh, Rust Belt states. I wouldn't want to stake the house on it. Detroit is a very interesting uh, city because uh, a lot of lot of black men there is also are moving towards Trump. Uh, very very keen on his reindustrialization policy, and I think Detroit is one certainly to keep our eye on because I think that could easily sway the election one way or another. I mean, if the Democrats start losing in urban centers um, in the Rust Belt, uh, it's going to be a seriously bad night for them, um, like a, <laughs> a catastrophe of a night for them. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it's certainly no, it's, there's no question that Michigan in particular, since the, uh, the deindustrialization of the United States has kind of picked up speed. I mean, Michigan is one of the big losers of the last 20 years. Um, mm. and, and maybe Trump is starting to speak their language. Um, you know, the, 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 the realignment um, of various different... Like, it, it does seem like the electoral uh, groups are in flux at the moment in the United States. And Trump is trying to weld something together um, that would be atypical for the GOP. Um, you know, somewhat like oh, what Obama welded together although they've never quite been able to recapture his particular ability to win using that rainbow coalition um so trump seems to be trying to bring the various stripes of working class together um and kind of push out some of the more um effete um chamber of commerce style republicanism and if he can do it he's gonna have a very he's gonna have he's gonna have an advantage in a lot of these uh in these uh left behind um deindustrialized parts of the united states no question in my mind so what should we look out for on election night what's gonna be a key early indicator as to how the night will go i think if we're looking at the states that are going to come in first, now again, it's it's it, it, it's tough to tell because I know that certain states have said have given themselves the hedge that they will take several days with which to count the votes. Which I mean, uh, for my money, I, I I don't see how that is. Um, <laughs> that's not a I if I if 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 my if my local MP took thirteen days to um, be determined, um, I would I would I would be asking uh, questions as to how we change that process. Let's let's put it that way. Um, but if he has, because I mean we're going to have the early voting data, like we're we're for the states that publish that anyway. But if he's looking particularly strong on the day in Pennsylvania and. Um, you know any of these these northeastern states that that will be a strong indicator i think that he is doing well and then in terms of like the senate down ticket i mean if we look at the five kind of um you know the the, the main toss ups for the senate michigan ohio and pennsylvania are all on that list uh, as is wisconsin in fact so four of the key swing states are in this northeastern block. So if Trump is really outperforming or is doing gangbusters in the top of the ticket, then those seats are very much going to be in play, I think. Um, the other states as they come in, like Arizona and Nevada, we may well, we might have to uh, we, we might have to wait longer for that. But um, in terms of early indicators, I would say that we're that those 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 few states in the northeast, um, how well he's doing there. Um, because that also is going to have, um, like how well he's doing in that segment is also going to have a measurable impact on that, not only the Senate, but the house as well. So that, that would be the main thing I would be looking out for. How well is he doing in Michigan and Pennsylvania and Ohio? Although I think Ohio is somewhat of a lock. So. And the, the million dollar question, uh, what, what are your predictions? Uh, who's going to get which swing states? Uh, will there be any surprises uh it, it really is difficult to say at this point i think that that particularly those rust belt states i think it is advantage trump right now um like i know that whenever biden collapsed it was looking like even places like virginia were in danger um even i think new jersey got close at a point which would have been <laughs> which would have been almost unbelievable um Surprise states that could surprise me. Minnesota has not always been historically bad territory for Trump. 
So not inconceivable that if he's actually outperforming polling expectations, that Minnesota becomes more competitive than we might think. Virginia, I, I, I suspect that that was a bit of a mirage. Like, I mean, Virginia is like connected to Washington. It's got like, I think the highest concentration of, uh, of DC apparatchiks living there. So I, I, I would still say that that's probably safe for the Dems. If it's not, it's, it's, it's a disastrous night for them. Like, it's, it's really, really bad. Um, but I would say that those would be the two ones I would be kind of interested to see, Minnesota especially. Um, New Hampshire is just impossible to predict. Uh, it, 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 they, they could, they could return a Republican governor by twenty points, and then just to say, like you know, return Kamala by thirty points or vice versa. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I would never want to predict the, uh, the Granite State and how it they was, behave on, on the day. It was the tightest race in twenty sixteen, I believe. I think Hillary won it by zero point two four percent, something like that. It, yeah, I remember looking at that as it was coming in live, and I was like, good. God, that was very close. Like New Hampshire is very much down the middle. On, or it certainly was down the middle uh, uh, for that election. Um, but they were decisively um, for the Democrats with Joe Biden at the top of the table. Mm. Remains to be seen if Kamala from California can 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 inspire that same loyalty. But um, I, I would say that if we were looking at those, what we should also maybe be looking at and like, and that th this could be more important is like, if Trump is outperforming, like, I don't think there's, I, I, I would say that there's a 0% chance of a winning New York, but if his output is better, that's going to be really important for how many of these New York seats that are in play uh, in the house he holds. Um, but in terms mm. of which state I would say is the one to watch for the biggest surprise kind of a, have a, have a, have a, have a sneaking feeling about Minnesota. Let's put it that way. Okay. okay. And the, the house and Senate. I mean, the house is so it's too close to call. Um, if Trump is doing really, really well, um, then I'd say that there's a better than 50% chance that the, uh, the GOP hold a lot of those really contested seats in New York, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that, that, that was, one of the surprises of the the midterms was that the, the the only three states which swung towards the Republicans was Florida, not a surprise, but the other mm. two are New York and California. <laughs> yeah, it's it's and that is because if we're, I'm just, I'm just looking at it right now, like it's a lot of California seats, some Arizona seats that are kind of like in play. New York seems to be up. There's a lot of New York seats that are in like toss over territory. A few Nevada seats that are in New, like toss up territory. Um, how well Trump outperforms in these states is going to decide how well those um, those incumbents either survive or crash out, you know. Um, in terms of the Senate, it's it's really difficult to say, like, because on a really good night, I could see that the GOP having 54 senators at the end of that day. Um, like, I mean, Michigan's an open seat, so there's no incumbent there. And at least as relates to like Pennsylvania, like Ohio, it's within a point. Pennsylvania, it's like 1.4. So, I mean, like that is still in statistical tie territory. And Wisconsin's also within a point. Like, so there's, there, there's, a, there's a scenario where the GOP only have 51 seats after that. There's a scenario where they, you know, completely crash out. But like, if you were looking at it from a probability perspective, they're, they're almost certainly going to win it. Um, but how strong their victory is really impossible to tell at this vantage. I, I would say that they're, that they're, uh, the possibility of them flipping at one of those one point territory seats is quite strong. So I would say that the GOP will quite likely end up with more than 51 um, senators day after. But again, it's all contingent on how much of this, uh, you know, the, the hidden Trump voter. Um, or not shows up in the day because it could be that the hidden Trump voter is totally accounted for and they're just going to lose all of these seats. I don't think so, though. Just before we go, let, let's say uh, the, the current polls are right, the, the bookies are right, Donald Trump wins the presidency. Um, what would his first 100 days look like? What, what does a Trump presidency look like? Well, I mean, if you listen to uh, a lot of people, he's going to cross the Rubicon and uh, take Washington by storm and uh, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, here's the thing. 
I think in many ways, Trump is a known quantity. Um, his first 100 days of his next presidential term, if he wins it, are going to be decided by how well he does in the, or like how well the GOP does in the House and Senate. Mm. I would say that if he does pick up, like if he has a majority in both the House and the Senate, we should probably expect some kind of bill to tackle immigration within that 100 days. Um, his big, beautiful wall. Um, I, I would say I would rate that as quite likely. Um, in terms of the foreign policy stuff, like, I mean, what's interesting is, is that I think, like, I, I would safely say that if Trump is in that post, there's going to be a deal cut vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, um, w like, between himself and and and, and one, one Vladimir. Um, it seems like the GOP in general are just not interested in this question anymore. Um, so, so I would say if, if, and whereas if you like if if Harris wins, I would say that Ukraine will kind of be continued to be supported. And this this comes from um, one of our one of our mutual friends, uh, Collingwood had a had a had a, a big chat with a guy called Policy Tensor, and it seems from his vantage that Harris is far more likely to stay involved in Ukraine and try and like de-escalate or um, you know kind of detach themselves from the Middle East and Trump seems to be the opposite. So that, that that would be my expectations on the foreign policy front. Economics, I mean, Jesus, it's 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 a it's a dire picture out there. So I mean and Trump has never has famously never met any, you know, entitlement that he wouldn't be quite happy to maintain. So I mean, from an economic front, I mean maybe he's just gonna make a big push on um opening up energy. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of those oil pipelines that were canceled, maybe they get restarted. Um, maybe he tries to, um, you know, some modified taxation, but I think the immigration and the foreign policy stuff are going to be the most impactful for us. Um, or, you know, like not even for us, the immigration is more impactful for the United States. Foreign policy is going to be the biggest difference for us sitting in this side of the world. Um, so that, 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 that would be my just stalt feeling. I mean, ultimately... You know, as as we've seen from Trump, Trump is very much a creature of id. So who knows? He he, he could very much take a very different path to that one. Um, but and you know maybe maybe the uh, team that he has behind him now, because famously he didn't have much of a team when he won in twenty sixteen. Maybe he's learned. Maybe they hit the ground running, and they have a better implementation team this time. Um, so we should look out for if he wins, who he appoints to that cabinet. We may even see one. Uh, one Elon Musk appointed, um, and, and, <laughs> and he famously has been flinging money at the uh, Trump campaign. Um, so <laughs> enormous war chest uh, from himself. Uh, but that, that that would be my that would that would be my that would be my my guess. I I, I don't expect very. There's there's always more continuity than there is um, divergence between these various figures. But I I, I would say the immigration front. I mean, Trump might be measurably different there. Um, one, one could scarcely have been more uh, uh, more divergent between the two camps, between um, Joe Biden and uh, Trump on this issue. So that that would be the main market difference, I would say. And could we see a, a realistic scenario where the the Democrats uh, win the House and they they try to impeach Trump again, or even try to have his I mean, any college votes cancelled. Uh... Uh, I would say that the electoral college vote won that kind of um, that that kind of um, skullduggery doesn't seem to have much cut through. In terms of impeachment, I mean, at this point, there's nothing to stop it. Um, they've they've done it twice already. Um, a majority of plus one in the house. I'd say that it's not impossible that they'll attempt it, particularly as. Uh, as one Donald John Trump has been known to run his mouth, so he uh, very much uh, has the capacity, even if it's uh, even if it's mendaciously edited, he has the capacity to 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 step on rakes and give them the ammunition needed for it. But I would say that at this point, if they get if they have a majority of one, they'll try it again. Um, in terms of, and then if they, if they have a majority of one in the house, well, then we should probably expect that most of the things that Trump would do, and this is again assuming he wins, most of the stuff he will do will be um, via a presidential decree or whatever they call it. Um, so the, that that would be my assessment anyway. I would say that if he wins and the Democrats take the house, impeachment is like a hundred percent certainty. Um, <laughs> you know, 
show me the show me the man and i'll find the crime so to speak <laughs> yeah it's, it's never a dull day with uh i mean across the pond i mean to be honest i mean i i don't want to i don't want to rag on them too badly because of how direly uh our own politics are going <laughs> at the moment but uh a, a lot of the time especially with the uh I, I wouldn't want to intrude on private grief for where i think the state of the republic is but given that we currently have uh <laughs> have a have a terminator in 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 number 10 um who seemingly has <laughs> has never paid for a single item of clothing in his life um <laughs> you know i mean maybe 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 those in glass houses should not throw stones oh actually now that we 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 forgot a very important topic because we actually have something to like as 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 men from the UK we have something that we are actually in this cycle now, given that the uh, the the Labour Party were planning to send over a bunch of staffers. <laughs> the British which, are coming. The, the British are coming. I mean, uh, you know, given that this is my country, I can speak a little more frankly on this. It's like, what were they thinking? Now, if Trump wins, they have made a real enemy of. It. Like, where was the upside there? Unless they really think that Kamala is going to win, and even then, if you, you if you've actually soured fifty percent of the United States' political structures against you, like that is the stupidest thing a new government could possibly do. And what the upside for it was, like I, I genuinely, it, it's a complete, it, it's a complete mystery to me. And then uh, virtue signaling—that's all it was, surely. I mean, imagine you're you're you're. American from rural Pennsylvania, and you got a Labour <laughs> knocking at your door, and oh yeah, I'll probably vote Kamala Harris now. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure that a Labour spad showing up to your Appalachian house and telling you about the virtues of progressivism is really gonna, really gonna sell you <laughs> on, 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 on the K hive. You know, nah. I mean, it's not just virtue signaling, though. I mean, like, it does seem that there is an apparatus linked to that fellow McSweeney uh, that pre-exists this campaign. Um, and, you know, like, it, it, they're definitely on maneuvers there. Like, there's there's, there's definitely some influence from Charm Starmer's chief of staff over in the United States. But, I mean, I, I got to be honest, if you were Keir Starmer, David Lammy, and you saw that, I would be like, that would be that would have to be smothered quickly like because like there's going to be no way to have a foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis the united states if you've royally screwed over your um <laughs> reputation with the man who is running it um you might be in the position where you are literally compelled to send um nigel farage as ambassador in order to smooth <laughs> things over which we, we shall see i guess <laughs> unbelievably stupid decisions but um not not that i expect much better from them so you know should be an interesting uh relationship between uh keir starmer and uh trump if he were to be elected oh i can't wait i really can't wait <laughs> uh i mean like you know if if we didn't if we didn't laugh we'd cry so i'm i'm choosing to laugh well, I can, I can imagine if if Jenrick was to become tory leader you, you'd have trump uh going off the pints with him and saying, Bobby J, great guy, great guy. <laughs> <laughs> Not as good as my friend Nigel. Nigel's going to win it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, my Trump cat, my Trump is terrible. But yeah, it's it's going to be interesting. Like I, 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 I would wonder how much longer Lammy will be in post if uh, he can't manage that relationship yeah. well. And uh, I mean, you know, Less said about the performance of Cher Lamy, the better, um, to be honest. Um, but, you know, a lot of things can change in politics. I mean, like, maybe maybe Starmer actually has a rapport with Trump. That cause, I mean, here's the thing. From what I can glean from Trump, if you're nice to him, he's nice back to you. And, like, by he is, like, by inclination an Anglophile. Like, I mean, you're kind of just like... Oh, massive, massive. Like, yeah. yeah, like, I mean... It, it it strikes me as preposterous that no one in the British government has ever sought to like utilize those plus those pluses to actually no, get no. things out of him. But it, it seems like that they're just in, incapable of doing it. I, I've never quite understood it. Like, I mean, if, if he's a creature of period, use that to your advantage. Like, I mean, why not? <laughs> well, because Sadiq Khan doesn't like him. Well, great. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, uh, eight days to go, and uh, yeah, we shall see. Will will the world be turned uh, upside down? Uh, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll give my disclaimer now. If I was wrong about absolutely every prediction, that is just like simply because it's impossible to predict the United States election. Yeah. So you know, I'm 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 getting my caveat in now. Um. <laughs> I, I promised the missus I wouldn't bet too much on the, on this election, but uh, I, I got too much into the hype. And yeah, Trump Trump has been very well backed by uh, my uh, Bet365, let's just say that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, for your sake and uh, for, the, for, uh, for, for, for your, the sake of your reputation or your relation with the missus, I, I hope it all works out for you. <laughs> I hope you haven't done like any uh, accumulators or what, what do we call them? You know, the, the multi-stage bets. That might be a bit more dangerous, I think. <laughs> a few, a few. Oh, no. All right. Well, any fingers crossed, touch wood for you, man. <laughs> well, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, Pangolins. And uh, yeah, I'm sure we'll be in touch uh, on election night itself. <laughs> yeah. All right. Perfect. Thanks, man. Chat later. Thanks everyone uh, for listening too. Bye bye. Bye.